It's a, a pleasure to be here this morning. I, uh, Even though it looks like I'm sitting in the uh, rotunda at the old Egyptian museum, I'm actually in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, surrounded by five inches of snow, which we received yesterday. I am going to uh, go right to my presentation. And so uh, let me uh, load up the um, share slides here. And there we go. Uh, we're going to talk today about a subject very near and dear to me, and that is uh, both Egyptology and honeybees. And when we uh, when we talk about uh, uh, honeybees and, and Egypt, it, it becomes an interdisciplinary topic. We're going to touch on entomology, Egyptology, archaeology, linguistics, and chemistry before we're through today. And uh, I hope that many of you had the opportunity to go to Egypt. Uh, it is a, a fabulous place, and uh, I've been there. I've lived there for more than a year of my life now, and uh, uh, it's uh, I, I just love that country. And uh, it does it, it evokes all sorts of images of of uh, ancient archaeology and what have you. So let's uh, start in. I have a, a goal for the, the this topic. It is what did I just do here. I have a goal today, and that goal is to um, is to look for ancient Egypt's beekeepers. There's a reason for that. <clears throat> in ancient Egypt, it was believed that if your name was remembered, you had an afterlife. And so what I would like to do is try to find a true beekeeper, not the pharaoh during the time that bees were kept, but somebody that actually stood next to the hive, got the bees out, extracted the honey and so on. I'd like to, put, I'd like to give, make sure that there is a beekeeper in the Egyptian afterlife. And so that's our goal. And it's going to involve touching on these various disciplines I just mentioned ago. And uh, as a background, let you know why we're doing that or how we do this. The ancient Egyptians' uh, view of the soul is extremely different from ours uh, that we have in, in our Judeo-Christian uh, cultures. It includes several parts to a soul. So their idea of a soul is very different from ours. It includes the ba, the ka, the body, the shadow, and the name. And one of those comp components... Uh, if they're still around in the after the, the, the individual is deceased, they will have an afterlife. The Ba is the personality of the, of the deceased. And it returns back to the body in the tomb. So that's part of the reason why there was these elaborate tombs and they tried to protect the body with, with linen and, and preservatives and so on. The Ka is that vital essence of life. It, what, it's, that, it's what life is. It's not the memories of the personality, but it's life. The body is what's needed to preserve the ba as it returns to the tomb every, every evening. Something of a surprise is that the shadow also contains something of the person it represents. And lastly, the name. The ancient Egyptians believed that uh, you would live as, for as long as your name was spoken. And so our goal today is to find the name of an Egyptian beekeeper. And so that would give them a life after death of course uh all this is the the search for honey this liquid gold which is uh, uh, in the, uh honey is produced by honeybees from the order insect order hymenoptera and uh, they live in these elaborate uh, uh colonies uh, with a queen uh, workers and drones and um the product that we are using on it. In fact, we we as a as a species use a lot of insect products, and in particular, we're using, of course, honey uh, and beeswax are the two major products that we use from ancient Egypt and even to, even today. This is a photograph taken inside a, a, a colony, and if you uh, look hard, you might even see the queen. She is up towards one o'clock. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. I think you can. I'm sure she's that rather long, uh, elongated abdomen insect you see up in the upper right hand corner, not right in the corner, but about an inch down uh, uh, from what you're seeing. That is the queen. So, what we're trying to get in all this, of course, is is the honey, and we know that the Egyptians used honey uh, because we find. The, the hieratic, uh, excuse me, the, the, yes, the hieratic uh, symbol for honey written on a lot of potsherds, uh, broken pieces of pottery. Here you see two pieces. These are from the Petri Museum in London. And that little squiggle you see, that sort of like loop that goes uh, right uh, right to left, that's the body of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the honeybee. 
the legs are below it, and the two little lines of that V are represent the wings. So where did beekeeping begin? And to do that, we need to go to Spain to find out where that started. Uh, here, about a 90-minute drive southwest of Valencia is a little town called uh, uh, Bicor. And Bicor uh, is, uh, is, is near what, a UNESCO site uh, that is uh, extremely important for us because it's where we see the first interaction of humans with honeybees. That little red uh, uh, spot on the map is, is where the uh, Bicor is located. When you get to Bicor, you walk along the edge of the sort of uh, uh, cliff. Actually, it's more further down than the, than the top of the, of the, of the hill. And uh, when you get to it, you'll see this area here. This is on behind bars because, as I said, it is a UNESCO a World Heritage Site. And it's inside this, this, this cage, if you will, in this cave shelter where uh, the oldest example of humans interacting with uh, bees is found. So let's go inside. And this is what you see. Uh, you might not see much, but here I'll, I'll zoom in a little, a little more in a bit. But here towards the very top, is a little hole that holds about the size of a dime. And then extending around it are long, long uh, ropes, if you will, of images of what's rope. And here's a beekeeper next to it. Let's zoom in on that and show you what it looks, looks like. I put an inset in there that lets you see what the uh, pristine version of this would have been. But the honeybees are cavity nesters. Sorry, I keep hitting, hitting a button too soon. Uh, are cavity nesters. And the creator of this scene actually used a natural cavity in the rock wall to represent where the bees were living. Right next to the bee is a, a honey hunter. Uh, she is uh, holding onto the ropes that are behind the, uh, the uh, around her that are holding up to the, holding her up on the side of this cliff. Uh, and she has uh, got a bag in one hand, a container of some kind, and she's reaching into the cavity to steal the honey. Scattered around her, there are 15 uh, strange little lines, usually two parallel lines with a cross hatched to it, uh, that represent the honeybees that are swarming around her as uh, the individualism is uh, robbing the honey. I say I'm using the female gender because there's been a lot of discussion about this site. There are two, two honey hunters in this scene, and uh, this one at the very top, uh, right next to the, uh, the uh, cavity, is got a very narrow const uh, constricted waist. And it's, uh, many people now believe that that indicates that it was a female who was doing the honey hunting. Further down, you can't see it on this slide here, there is another honey hunter who doesn't have that narrow waist. It's almost like a stick figure, but that looks like a, a larger individual who might have been male. And it, it makes sense that uh, uh, women would be uh, uh, involved with honey hunting. They would weigh less than the men and, and they hold onto the ropes a little easier uh, and so on. Uh, this was discovered just 101 years ago in, uh, in, as I said, in, in Eastern uh, Spain. And uh, it is the first and oldest example that shows humans interacting with bees. Now, something that I can tell you about, uh, uh, and it, the, that, that scene is extremely small. It's only 21 and a half inches long, but it's probably the most uh, widely seen photograph of some kind of a, uh, insect interaction with humans that's ever been published. Uh, rather exciting, just last year, a new honey hunting scene was discovered, and here's part of it, and it shows an individual on a ladder uh, climbing up uh, to an area where there's uh, uh, bees. It doesn't have a natural cavity, but uh, the uh, uh, it, 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 it's one of now uh, seven scenes that we have in Spain that shows some aspects of honey hunting, and this dates back to about no more than 3,000 to 5,000 BC. This one's probably around 5,000 BC. And the uh, previous version is probably 3,000 BC. They were still getting good dates on that. But this isn't true beekeeping. This is honey hunting. And this kind of activity is still going on, particularly in Nepal. Here's a honey hunter dangling from a rope ladder. Uh, he has long sticks fashioned at the end with some kind of a cutting blade. And the bees they have in Nepal are not the bees we have here in, in the U.S., these are the giant honeybees, and they make these big, elaborate honeycombs that hang on the side of rocks or on the large branches. And he is at the—he's got friends at the top of the of, of the cliff holding the rope. He's slowly trying to cut the comb away, which will drop to the ground, hopefully into a basket by somebody on the ground. Now, this whole process of Nepal uh, honey hunting has created a whole series of of 
rules about who can control or hold the rope. And the only people that can hold the rope are the honey hunter who you see here on the, in his bee suit, the honey hunter's father-in-law or his brother-in-law. And why do you think that's the case? It turns out they're the only two people that cannot marry his wife should he fall to his death. So therefore, there's a strong, strong desire to make sure that he gets down safely and back up safely. Again, this is honey hunting, not beekeeping. For beekeeping, we need to have uh, beekeeping by definition is the provision of a natural, of an artificial cavity, if you will, within which bees will start the colony, will, the, the queen will lay eggs in the comb that the workers will be making, and uh, uh, she'll rear, uh, they'll, the, the workers will take care and rear the brood, and she'll produce more eggs and, and what have you. They'll produce honey. That's true beekeeping. Honey hunting is not beekeeping, but it seems like it would be a good precursor uh, to true beekeeping because we've actually observed chimpanzees, for example, in Africa, collect branches of different sizes and then wander until they found a wild colony of of, uh, of bees and then with the sticks tear into the into the uh, colony uh their heavy covering of, uh, of fur kept, keeps them from getting stung but uh, uh even our closest living relatives are honey hunters but we've taken it one step further we were providing uh artificial cavities within which bees can start another colony and the oldest group of people that did that were the ancient Egyptians. Now, there are some, some older examples that people thought may be uh, related to beekeeping. There's a, a painting in Turkey uh, that shows it looks like honeycomb, but no evidence of humans with it. Uh, and we do have potsherds, uh, broken pieces of pottery, where we can find residue of beeswax. But that could have been used for collect honey hunting to collect the comb. It could also have been for, for harvesting honey from beehives. But we don't have any real evidence of that. But where we see definitive evidence of beekeeping is with the ancient Egyptians. And they used bees for a number of things and for honey for a number of products. So here's just uh, five examples. In the upper left-hand corner, you've got a, a piece of pottery with the word honey on it. Not only is there the bee, uh, the honeybee symbol on there, but there's also a little loop which was, uh, represents a vessel and a dot for the half circle, which is the Egyptian word for, for honey. Uh, and that particular piece of pottery comes from Canaan. So the ancient Egyptians were actually importing honey and, and trading in honey as well. Uh, on the upper right is a papyrus from the Louvre, and this is a prescription. And it's a prescription for, uh, for some, treating some malady. And of the 900 uh, prescriptions that we have from ancient Egyptian medicine, uh, over 500 include honey. And the ancient Egyptians were felt to have, thought to have the best doctors in the world. When Persia came in and conquered uh, Egypt, they took all the doctors back to Persia. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a prescription uh, that uses honey as an ingredient. On the lower left, we have an offering uh, to a deceased pharaoh. Uh, you see the honeycomb is in a, in a bowl. On top of it are the, are the drawings of, of two bees. Uh, and uh, that tells us that, that we're looking at honeycomb. That, would have, that offering, uh, as long as it's painted on the, uh, uh, on, the, on the tomb wall, is thought to symbolize that spell that could continually get, provide honey to the deceased in the afterlife. And on the bottom left is a wax figurine. And beeswax was, a, was magical to the ancient Egyptians. Uh, you could mold it into whatever shape you wanted. In this case, it's, it's molded into one of the sons of Horus to help protect the, uh, uh, the uh, in, in, in internal organs of the deceased. And uh, the... Uh, the thing about beeswax is that you can burn it, and it burns a very bright light. And given the Egyptian sense of uh, an awe of the sun god Ray, uh, that would mean something. But when it burns, it leaves no ash. And so, uh, in uh, in ancient Egyptian theology, uh, you would find beeswax uh, figurines placed in tombs. You would find, in this case, uh, beeswax sons of Horus to help protect the internal organs, especially around the twenty second dynasty, and. Uh, we also see beeswax being used in some medicinal products as well. It was also used as an adhesive to uh, 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 combine bone and wood with bits of uh, uh, like uh, flint that's been shaped and worked to provide a cutting edge. So it's a rather, rather important uh, uh, commodity uh, as well. Now, those are some of their uses. Uh, 
their final use I'll mention is, is um, as a barter. The ancient Egyptians did not have any coinage or money as we know it. If you worked for the, if you worked uh, in ancient Egypt, you'd be paid at the end of the day or after a day or two with some commodity like wheat or linen or honey or beer. And then knowing that there's a standard value of that, you could then go shopping and trade with people who had goods that you wanted and they wanted what your, they wanted your honey and so on. I don't know if that would work anymore here in the uh, uh, in 2023. But their interest in, in bees goes back very early. Uh, this is a uh, from 2000, 2900 uh, BCE, and it's the one of the oldest hieroglyphs. It's in that red circle at the upper upper left. It's one of the oldest hieroglyph symbols for the honey bee found in ancient Egypt. This is on display at the British Museum in London, and uh, for this is very crude. And you find these in the in dynasty from uh, the pre-dynastic areas, but also dynasty one and two. By the third dynasty, the carving of the honeybee uh, becomes much more uh, precise and elaborate. And indeed, you know, unless it looks like a like a wasp, the antennae are a little long. Uh, there's a lot of people discussing whether it's truly a, a bee or a wasp, but it's clearly associated with honey. And so, therefore, we it doesn't matter whether it's a bee or a wasp, but it's it's the insect that produces honey. This symbol to the left of it, that sort of oval shape, is a cartouche, and in the in the cartouche uh, is where uh, you would see you'd find the hieroglyphs for a, a pharaoh being written. This happens to be the cartouche for Ramses II. Uh, that's what that's what's written within the cartouche. That's French for uh, cartridge. And so when Napoleon's troops were in uh, in Egypt in the 1790s, uh, and they found these symbols, these hieroglyphs, they called them cartouche. Uh, to just talk about that uh, that. Uh, uh, figure. Uh, to the right, you'll see the honeybee, a, uh, a sedge plant, and two half circles. That in Egyptian, that would say Nezubiti. It stands for he or the king of the upper and lower Egypt. So this, in this case, it would be Ramses, king of upper, upper and lower Egypt. And if you ever have a chance to go to an Egypt, Egyptological museum or go to Egypt itself, there are several places you can actually interpret some of the hieroglyphs. And here's a little uh, hieroglyph uh, grouping to illustrate uh, how the honeybee uh, hieroglyph uh, factored into uh, Egyptian carving. So the very top is the he of the sedge and the bee. That also means uh, 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 king of upper and lower Egypt. You can even find this on the Rosetta Stone in London. If the, the on B, but just below that, that uh, that's a symbol. It's a cylinder seal on a, on a necklace uh, next to a bee, and the bee also represented Lower Egypt. Uh, so that would tell you the sealer of the king of Lower Egypt. The word for bee itself is uh, the honeybee hieroglyph, that half circle, that's a T sound. And that line, that up and down symbol line, tells you that symbol, the main symbol there is what, what the word actually represents. Honey, same way, same thing, a half circle with the honeybee, but also a vessel. And then if you have a, a human figure with that, uh, either standing or kneeling, that would be the beekeeper. And then at the very bottom, we have uh, the chief beekeeper of Amun. It turns out every major temple of Asia, Egypt had beekeepers. Bee, honey and, and bees was a very important product that was used not only for local economy, but also to help uh, uh, finance the, uh, the temple works as well. And if you, if you look carefully when you visit, let's say, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, or the, the Field Museum in Chicago, uh, or any place that's got a large Egyptology collection, you can find some of these words. This is a, a stila from uh, the, at the British Museum, and that little black circle in the very middle, I'll, I'll zoom in on it here, there is the word for honey. And so the, uh, the actual uh, the description here is, it's a, it's a list of items that were provided to the deceased uh, in the afterlife. So we have that honeybee hieroglyph. We also have the hieratic, uh, hieratic honey, uh, honey symbol, if you will, glyph, and that's to the left. And Hieratic is the way the Egyptians wrote in sort of a more cursive style, sort of like our, our, our cursive that we would have in when you write, as opposed to the formal printed style, which would be the, the honeybee uh, that we're used to, that you're seeing, the very carefully carved honeybee. So on the up at the top there, on the right is the carefully carved honeybee hieroglyph, and next it's the hieratic. And you'll find this on papyrus a lot. And uh, this is a rather important papyrus uh, uh, for us. It was, uh, it was found by Salt. He was the first Egyptian consul to Egypt back in the in 1816. 
He was the counsel who hired Belzoni to dig out the paws of the Sphinx. He also found Abu Simbel and all sorts of things like that. And you'll see here, this symbol here, you'll see right down here. And this phrase is very important. It sort of summarizes what the Egyptians thought of these. And that phrase reads, The god Ray wept, and the tears from his eyes fell on the ground and turned into a bee. The bee made his honeycomb and busied himself with the flowers of every plant. And so wax was made, and also honey, out of the tears of Ray. Honey is produced by bees which formed out of the tears of the god Ray. And Ray was, a, Ray was a very important god of the ancient Egyptians. Every day the sun would rise in the east. That was the rebirth of the god Ray. He was real. And so honey was indeed a, a gift of the gods. So there's a, a brief background of why honey is important to the ancient Egyptians. Can we find ourselves that beekeeper? Well, we find that we know they had beekeepers and they recognized them because here's a, a scarab from this is at, not on display, but it's at the British Museum. And this on the underside of this scarab beetle, which is almost they're, they're so common there. Some people refer to them as the big pens of ancient Egypt. But they, if you wanted to sign something, and let's say well, you, you tied something with a, knot, with a knot, that knot would be encased in, in uh, mud. And then you put the seal on it. That would tell you who sealed the uh, thing. The hieroglyphs on the underside uh, read, chief beekeeper, and king's acquaintance. So we're not sure why he needed, to, uh, how he became acquainted with the with the pharaoh, uh, nor do we have a name of who this individual was, but it does tell us that there was indeed a beekeeper, and beekeeping was important in the middle, uh, the middle kingdom. Now, here today, most beekeepers work independently, but in ancient Egypt, beekeeping was an organized occupation. Uh, with a, oh, the, of course, the head of the government was the pharaoh. Below the pharaoh was a vizier, and that's almost like a prime minister. If I think, look at the British system, you've got a, you know, King Charles III, and then there's a prime minister uh, below him. Uh, and then they, below there, there's a whole series, a whole tier, a tier of, 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 of individuals involved with the production of, of uh, honey. You have the overseer of the beekeepers of all the lands, you have the overseer of the beekeepers, that's your local area. You have a chief beekeeper, the one who's in charge of all the beekeepers at the particular spot, and a beekeeper. And I find this just amazing that they would, that back, back, <laughs> you go back uh, 4,000 years, and they've got, they've got organized beekeeping as a central occupation. And uh, I mean, to me, one of the most significant things about ancient Egypt is not, not, not the fair, not the, the, the pyramids. What's more important is the ability to civil, to have a civil society, uh, to have a, a society that could organize the people to build the pyramids, the infrastructure for that. You've got to cut stone. You've got to transport stone. You have to bring people in. You've got to feed these people. You have to care for them if they're injured, uh, let alone have the architects or anybody else to plan to build the pyramids. That ability to organize people with a common goal, that just blows my mind. That goes back 4, 000, more than 4,000 years ago. It's incredible. Also, as I mentioned, there are temple beekeepers uh, that answered to the, uh, to the uh, priests of, the, of temples, and that's because temples had their own uh, economy of the location where they were located. So let's look at some of the archaeological evidence that we have for beekeeping uh, in ancient Egypt. In the first place, let's, we're going to start from the farthest back in time. And then we'll move forward to the more recent times. Let's take us back to the uh, the uh, solar temple of the pharaoh Nesarayani. This dates at 2450 BCE. Uh, it's not one of the major sites you'll see if you go to uh, uh, to Egypt. This is at Abu Sur. You can see the pyramids of Abu Sur if you look south from the Great Pyramid. Uh, but most of this is rubble. And uh, the pharaoh at the time, uh, Nesarayani, there's a bust of his at the... Uh, um, Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York, and uh, this almost sounds like <laughs> sounds like a Harry Potter reference, but right here on the right side of the temple, there's these two partial walls badly destroyed. That section is called, as I say, it's a very Harry Potter term, the Chamber of the Seasons. And in there, they found we, the, there was a whole series of reliefs about different activities that are done at different times of the year. And one of those uh, reliefs 
shows how the, the Egyptians kept bees. And the uh, site was removed in the uh, back between around, uh, between 1895 and uh, 1905 uh, at Beauchart. Uh, here's the actual scene. It's at the uh, Neues Museum in Berlin. And uh, you really can't tell what's going on here because the it, uh, all the paint has been lost except for one small portion. But let me draw in what what this uh, what this shows. And what it shows is a whole series of events uh, from uh, har possibly harvesting honey, separating honey, and then sealing it. So let's uh, let's go to I'm gonna I'm gonna brighten this up a little bit and go to uh, uh, for comparison. Here's the the whole scene, the cartoon that that that, that I drew for the uh, for the. Uh, uh, actual etchings on the on the rock but you'll going from left to right uh that stack of of uh, of ends that you see on the far left hand side those are the beehives ancient Egyptian beehives were cylindrical and they were uh and they were stacked like like wood would be stacked and we see an individual in uh here the the far left kneeling he's got something to his face uh the hieroglyphs above it mean uh to blow or to make a sound and what we're not sure what they're doing. If indeed to, to, to blow might mean it was a, some people think it was a smoker, that the smoke was being produced inside a container and he was blowing into the hive to quiet the bees. The trouble is that does not look like any uh, honeybee, uh, uh, honeybee smoker that we see in other Egyptian uh, uh, tombs. Uh, to make a sound is an interesting idea because it turns out the queen bee, when she emerges from her cell, after she after she's uh, matured, she'll emit a sound. And if there are other adult queen bees that are still in their queen cells, they will make a pitch, a high pitch sound. And uh, there are beekeepers that do this today. They still do this today with the traditional Egyptian beehives. Uh, and you can hear that if you've got good hearing. And so what the beekeepers today will do is they'll open up the hive. They'll take those queen cells out, put them into an empty cylinder along with some other workers and more, a little bit of comb, seal it up. So they were actually using uh, the calling of the queen uh, to do artificial swarming. That's something that we don't do at all anymore in, in, in North America. But uh, that's what's actually going on there. That tells us that the Egyptian sense of beekeeping was really, really quite elaborate. Uh, next in the second uh, panel are three individuals uh, clearly pouring uh, this guy is the the one the one on the far left here. The second individual from the farthest left, but the uh, this one is pouring an elongated uh, um, something into a larger pot from an elongated narrower pot. Then there's a kneeling individual holding a pot steady while another individual is pouring. What's neat is this this um, uh, this pot. It's got a spout, but the spout is at the base, and it looks very much like a a, a fat separator that you use after you make a roast or. A, uh, or a pork roast, and all the fat goes at the top above that the opening to that spout, and you can pour out all the the, the juices without the fat uh, uh, using that structure. I've seen a pot, a pot like this at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and to test this, I actually took some honeycomb, I crushed it, and put it into one of those uh, uh, fat separators, put it in the hot sun one summer, it was about 105 that day, and slowly, all the wax floated to the top and I was able to pour out the honey without the wax from below that layer of wax at the top. Uh, we know that the that that could be one way of, of separating a lot of the uh, the honey from beeswax. Uh, let's go back here. Here we are. Uh, the uh, hieroglyphs at the top mean to fill or to pour. Uh, the third uh, structure here uh, is badly damaged. We see there's a one kneeling individual, one standing individual. Their arms here, very similar. We see over here uh, to the left of it, show they're pouring something. We don't know what because uh, it's it was damaged in, uh, in excavation. And it means to press or to squeeze. That may be the way in which they could take beeswax and, and separate uh, what little honey might still be in the beeswax. On the very far right, the last uh, section here, you'll see at the top above that in the actual relief, there's a lot of color left here. And what we see here is the Egypt, here's a cylinder seal, which means to seal uh, the word for bee uh, and an individual with a container and he's tying a rope around the top to seal it together. This means sealing honey. This dates at 2450 BCE, 4,000, uh, 4, 450 years ago. 
that shows a mature beekeeping practice with so many individuals involved uh, from collecting the honey to processing the honey and the sealing of honey. But nobody's named here. We don't have the name of any of these beekeepers. We do have up at the Cleveland Museum of, uh, of Art and also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, New York, statues of a man by the name of Vinaykara, and he was the overseer of the beekeepers. He actually worked at the solar temple of Nezareani, so the, this individual was contemporary with him, but he was the chief beekeeper. This is his fall store. This is in Cleveland, a small statue of him. This is, are two statues of him at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, he's a scribe. He's educated. He's probably not the one out there with the bees getting his fingers all sticky and, and what have you. Uh, but this individual would have taken note of, uh, would have made an accounting of all the honey collected uh, by, the, by the, uh, uh, the beekeepers. So to get more about how, uh, to figure out what else was going on with the ancient Egyptian beekeeping, we have to go about 900 years into the future to the tomb of Rechmare. And uh, this, I took some students here back in 2006, and this is the entrance to his tomb. And when you walk into his tomb, the, 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 there are two corridors that go both left and right. And on there, they, there's a lot of uh, scenes of people bringing tribute to the Pharaoh. And of those uh, groups of tributes, there are several instances where they're bringing honey. So you could have used honey to pay your taxes or a tribute, a tribute to the Pharaoh. As you walk farther down into the tomb going straight, you'll walk into this room that has this vaulted ceiling getting higher and higher and higher as the farther back in the, in the tomb you went. Uh, up here in the upper, uh, way up in the upper left here, you'll see the circling here, is Rechmere seated, looking at all the tributes coming in. And if you zero in on what's up there, uh, you'll see here's Rechmere. And in this panel right here, you see a honeybee, the half circle, and a container. Uh, that's the word honey. And in C, the, he's overseeing the honey that's being brought to the Pharaoh because in front, further to your left, as you walk into that room and look straight up to your left, you see this. This is the most complete painted scene of ancient Egyptian beekeeping. I made a, uh, a cartoon below it so we'd see it without the uh, uh, lost material and the, and the strange angle. Uh, the beehives now in this case are on the far right. They are cylindrical. They're rather large. And here you see a beekeeper reaching in and he's removing comb. And that comb is uh, like a small circular disc. And indeed, that's the kind of beeswax, how they're formed into a comb inside these cylindrical hives. Above it is an individual holding an incense burner. Now, remember, the ancient Egyptians thought that the bees were sacred, a gift of the gods. And so as a tribute to the bees, the Egyptians burned incense. And I'm sure that the beekeepers uh, saw that the bees quieted down and probably took that as a sign that the bees were happy with the offering. But that's a very different looking structure uh, that was smoking uh, for the bees compared to the structure we saw in the earlier in the early slide. The honey was then crushed and put in a large container and then placed in these larger containers uh, uh, as you can move more towards the left. Uh, they were even shaken to help sort of mix it up a little bit. The, honey, the beeswax would come up to the top, skimmed off, and then they would collect the, uh, uh, the beeswax in these uh, like almost like pitchers. Uh, and then they would be poured into these uh, into cups and then poured into these sort of diamond shaped structures sealed with beeswax around the edge. And this, this, these, you'll see these, there's two uh, individual ones on the far left and then two that are stacked just to, to the right of them. Uh, that was a unit of measurement uh, for uh, barter and for tribute and so on. So this is how they, they, they collected the honey, they extracted it, and they sealed it in these containers. Essentially the same thing we saw in the first beekeeping relief, but a little more a little uh, different because now we're at 1500 BCE. We're about 900 years uh, earlier uh, compared to the first the first relief. What I find interesting about this is look at those beehives, rather large cylindrical beehives. And that was where it was until uh, just a few years ago when my good friend Ami Mazar at uh, uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem found the oldest beehives. This is from Tel Rehov in Israel, dates at eight. 170 BCE, and you're seeing an individual behind a whole row of these beehives. And if you look at the size of the, the, the archaeologist and the beehives in front of them, that is very similar to what we see in the this illustration here. 
And so Rahal is an interesting location. Uh, it, uh, uh, d- during uh, Shoshank's uh, raid of, of uh, Jerusalem and part of and, and Israel, at the time, uh, Rehov was loyal to Egypt. And uh, this particular location had, uh, had three tiers of, of these beehives, had well large numbers of beehives in this particular uh, location. And it was near uh, some of the copper uh, uh, producing areas. And it's thought that the, all this was being all this all these beehives are being produced not so much for the honey, but maybe for the beeswax for what's called lost wax casting, and that's how you'd make things like copper vessels, and you can make copper uh, artifacts or, or figurines and what have you. Uh, the, that's the that's the the hypothesis right now is that this was primarily a place for development of of collecting beeswax for the lost wax casting. Lost wax casting was brought into uh, ancient Egypt by the Hittites, and uh, then if you remember the, the golden mask of King Tut, the cobra and the uh, uh, vulture, those heads, those golden portions at the top of his, his uh, mask were created by lost wax casting. So these are, this sort of, sort of confirms, you know, when we, t- we think about beehives, we think of those white boxes that we see here in, in now, but the most successful beehive that's been used that goes back thousands of years are these horizontal cylindrical beehives. Um, so it's a, it was this was a nice confirmation uh, to how beekeeping occurred uh, back during the time of uh, when ancient Egypt uh, was a, a major power uh, in the ancient world. Let's move forward now to uh, uh, the to around 600 BCE, about 300 years. This is the tomb of Pabasa. This is uh, a few hundred yards uh, away from Queen Hatshepsut's tomb in, uh, in Luxor on the West Bank. And uh, when you walk down these long stairwell, you can enter his tomb. Pabasa, uh, we're fortunate. Uh, Pabasa's coffin, uh, or sarcophagus, excuse me, sarcophagus was uh, uh, collected in the uh, by the British uh, many years ago. And uh, he's not a major figure. He's not a pharaoh. Uh, he was a uh, an official that took uh, that uh, was involved with uh, governmental work uh, in during the sixth dynasty. Uh, of ancient Egypt. Uh, it turns out his coffin is at the uh, uh, Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow. Uh, we have it here because this uh, wealthy individual in Glasgow wanted to be buried in, a, in an Egyptian sarcophagus, and he bought two of them. This was one of the two he purchased, and he decided not to use this one. So we can see now Pobasa. And uh, in Pobasa's uh, uh, tomb, we have a probably a very famous, uh, famous uh, beekeeping scene. It's more of a bee worshiping scene, in fact. You can see it's got four parts to it. Two of them are very badly damaged on the right. But on the left, you have an individual kneeling. There's a stack of horizontal hives here. Bee hieroglyphs all over the place. This is not to represent swarms. But what's interesting is the beekeeper is not doing anything with regard to the, the beehives. But he's holding his hands like this. And that's the Egyptian symbol for to praise or praise. So he's worshiping the bees. And uh, that's that's something significant. We know on the other side, because I'll, I'll show you that in a few minutes, but the, it turns out there was another tomb that tell, helps us fill in what's going on the other side. So I'll tell you about that in a minute. Above him, here you see another uh, individual here, and he's pouring honey. The, these things on the uh, behind him are, are uh, stands for vessels. And he's taking one of these vessels and he's pouring it into this container for sealing. On the other side, it's badly damaged. We see a, a kneeling individual. Uh, we see uh, on the other side, part of a tree and the feet of an individual, another man. So to see what's happening there, we've got to go to another tomb that was modeled after this tomb. And that's the tomb of Angkor. So we walk back up those stairs as you a few minutes ago. And you walk about 80 yards. And there is the entrance to the tomb of Angkor. He's also 26th dynasty. In fact, Angkor was the person who got Pabasa's job when Pabasa passed away. If you go down, that's uh, what you're seeing here is the Schwabti of Pabasa. About 400 of those have been found. There's one in New York uh, at the uh, the Met. We have one at the Louvre, and we have one at the British Museum as well. And uh, very dyed. He's always shown with a lot of hieroglyphs on his head, behind the head, and on the side. And his eyes are always bulging, so you can always identify uh, this individual uh, pretty easily. Uh, but when you go down into his tomb, you'll see this badly damaged. This is what's left of his tomb 
compared to what we saw at Pavasa. But we have enough of Pavasa to fill in what's what's missing from the uh, left-hand side. At the, above him, we see just the feet of an individual, probably doing the same thing, pouring things in. But with the with the wonders of Photoshop, I have been able to reconstruct what's on the other side. And what we see on the other side, down at the bottom, is another individual holding his hands with two vessels of, uh, of, of, of an offering uh, to the bees, another stack of beehives, the bees, uh, so on. Uh, at the upper top, we don't, that's still, we don't have all that to fill in, but we do know from, from uh, what's above it on core, there's a tree and the beekeeper is facing the bees with his hands like this. And that means to beckon. And then above it, there are two hieroglyphs, which may mean to fill. And so uh, uh, what he's maybe doing is he's beckoning the bees that you saw in front of the man pouring the honey into the small container to the trees. If that's the case, it's possible that the ancient Egyptians at, at 625 BCE recognized that bees worked the trees. They may not have known about pollination, but they know there was a big connection between, between bees and honey. But again, all these individuals... Uh, Pabasa was a, 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 a official. Uh, all the, uh, we, uh, Ankor was an individual. They weren't the beekeepers. Can we find a beekeeper? To do that, we got to look at one uh, at a very famous uh, uh, pharaoh. We've already mentioned him once. That's uh, Ramses II. He is the uh, pharaoh that had this massive temple, uh, Abu Simbel, built uh, uh, down almost just north of the Sudan, and. Uh, uh, he also, if you go to Luxor, you can find his um, his uh, his uh, mortuary tomb called the Ramesseum. This is an enormous complex. It's got granaries and, and food storages and all sorts of things. Uh, if you go to the British Museum, there's a great big giant bust in the uh, uh, main room of the, at the Egyptology collection, and that's where Belzoni found it, it right in front of these uh, these four statues. And he figured out how to drag it four miles to the Nile, get it on a boat get it up to Cairo, and then get from Cairo, get it to London. Uh, this is where we go next. And why I'm coming here, because way in the back, we go down this hall here towards the back, a stela, a stela was found, and the stela was found uh, with talking about the storage going on there, but also at the very bottom here, all these individuals who were doing things such as taking care of the garden, taking care of the horses, and right here, here is the symbol of a honeybee, a circle, and below it, a man. It's a beekeeper. And here is his name, Neferhetep. Neferhetep was a true beekeeper. So now, talking about all the officials we've been talking about today, we had, of course, Nikabra, uh, the overseer beekeepers. We had Rahma Ray, who was the vizier. We've got Pabas and Encore, two both middle-level administrators, none of them beekeepers. But we have been successful. We found Neferhetep. And I don't know about you, but I'm pleased to know that the Egyptian afterlife now has a beekeeper. Thank you for your attention.